So a little review from last Sunday. Last week, John's gospel story told his version of the first Easter morning and the first Easter week. He pieced it together this way. He begins with Mary Magdalene near the empty tomb. The disciples locked away in fear in a house. And then Jesus showing up again a week later for the sake of and the faith of Thomas, right? John's version talks about the surprise of Jesus' resurrection from death to life. And he says it catches everyone off guard and leaves them with fear and amazement and doubt and, and many questions. But that eventually it leaves them with faith and trust. In his version, the part that he's pieced together, Jesus says those of us who have not seen the risen Jesus, are extra blessed because we've come to faith anyway. Come to faith not through our eyes, but through our ears, right? And then he says Jesus tells all of his disciples to tell the story everywhere, right? That was last week. This morning, it's Luke's turn, his chance to tell his version of the Easter story. It's sort of the same story, but a little bit different. And he pieces it together like this. Luke says that that first morning, it's the women disciples of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of uh, James, I'm sorry, and a whole bunch of other unnamed women disciples go to the tomb but are told that Jesus is risen. They run and tell Peter and the other disciples who once again don't believe him. Right? Then that afternoon, Jesus appears to a couple who are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, meets up with them, opens up the scriptures, then at mealtime opens their eyes. And what they do is they get up in the night and run all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what they've seen and heard. What they've seen, they said, is Jesus risen. So this morning's gospel says that Jesus shows up in the midst of a discussion. The disciples are there, again in a room, still perhaps frightened, but when Jesus shows up, he almost scares them half to death. They're afraid what they're seeing is a ghost. And in this version pieced together, Jesus invites them all, not just Thomas, to step up and touch him, to see that he's flesh and bones well of sorts. Jesus even asked them for a fish sandwich to show them that he can eat, to show them that it really is him and not just a ghostly spirit. And then once again, he opens up all of Scripture, which is the Old Testament, the the prophets, Psalms, right? He opens that to all of them so that he says they can have a better understanding of just what God is doing in Christ. And then once again, Jesus sends them out as witnesses to the good news, the news that's about forgiveness and love and grace and faith and trust and mercy. Well, you get the idea, right? You know this. It's now your mission too. And all of your preachers, Tom and I included, and whoever is coming next, we will remind you of that all the time. (coughs) Share the stories, right? But my question for all of us this morning is, so, so what about this resurrection stuff? How are we to talk about that to others? The gospel stories say, well, now be sure, Jesus wasn't a ghost, not just a disembodied spirit, Luke says, even talks about the risen Jesus having flesh and bones of sort, says he could be touched, though I'm not sure any of us would really want to put our finger in the holes in his hands or the cut in his side, right? And he could eat, though of course we can't watch it go down from his mouth to his tummy, right? He's not a ghost. 
the stories say all of the disciples come to believe that this risen Christ is the same person as the Jesus that they knew before. The same, but in a different way, in a new way, in a good way. So, all these stories about the resurrection of one person in all of human history to be raised from death like this, what does it mean to teach us? Well, to be clear, we're not talking about resuscitation here, right? That's CPR. That's what EMTs do. That's not what happened to Jesus. And we're not talking about reincarnation either. We don't get an eternity of do-overs, right? We don't come back as something else depending on how good or bad we did this last time around. That's not what happened to Jesus. The stories talk about resurrection. They want us to know that the person, Jesus of Nazareth, is the same as the risen Jesus Christ. One and the same. But again, not quite the same. Touch, yeah? Hold on to? No. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. In the blink of an eye, he can be anywhere. Seems to me, resurrection talk can be kind of confusing. A mystery still. So, this is what's helped me in my own understanding. Maybe it will help you too. It comes from uh, Frederick Beekner's writing, uh, a Vermont Presbyterian and teacher at Philip uh, Exeter Academy. May help you. <laughs> I may challenge you. This is what he writes. The Bible's understanding of human beings is not that we have a body, but that we are a body. A body created by God. A body that God has breathed life into. That body and soul is what we are. Body and soul is what makes us, us. Body and soul together. So Beekner goes on to say this. He says, when we kick the bucket, you know what that means, right? When we die, <laughs> we kick the bucket 100%. There is nothing left to go marching on. That's the power of death and the sadness of dying. Beekner is writing and thinking like a Hebrew, like a biblical Hebrew. And he invites us to think the same way. But the thing is, certainly in North America or modern Christianity, most of us tend to think more like the Greeks, not like the biblical Hebrews, right? The Greeks' way of thinking is that our body dies, but our soul does not. It teaches sort of that our body is a taxi that hauls around that more important part of us, the soul, for as long as this lifetime lasts, right? It's as if our body is, in, is a prison holding our soul back until death sets it free. Greeks think this way, that the soul is immortal, and so that it simply goes on and on and on after our mortal body dies. So you can assume that our bodies go into the dirt or into the fire, and our soul goes to heaven, and that's just the natural way things are done. But I've come to believe that Beekner is right when he says that the Bible doesn't talk that way. The Bible doesn't speak of our immortality, but our mortality. The Bible stories speak of resurrection and say it's unnatural, it's unexpected. It says that we don't go on living beyond the grave because that's just how we've been made. It says we go to our graves as dead as a doornail and are given our new life, new life, back again as a gift of God because that's how God in Christ is made. Like the, in the Easter stories, 
with Jesus risen, God brings back a new revised version of all the things that make us us. I suppose that means the way we look, the sound of our voices, our personality, our capacity for loving, that the gift of the resurrection says we are the same me, but in a new and a different way. We're invited to trust what he says the Bible teaches. We die one day, someday. There's no escape from that. We know that. But Easter says the gift of resurrection works on dead people. Only on dead people. As a gift of God. Resurrection is that gracious, merciful, loving, compassionate, radical new gift found through the risen Jesus Christ. Then here's the other thing, that that resurrection comes not only someday at the very end, but at least begins right now in the very midst of the life we are now living. Our resurrection has begun in this way. Resurrection is the baptismal promise we receive from a loving God in Christ Jesus for us and one day, one great day for all of creation. Paul says something like that. Paul says, you and I live each day not as a people without hope, but as, but as people grounded and refreshed by our resurrection hope in Jesus Christ. Resurrection, new life, as a gift of grace, beginning even now. That's the promise that drove those first believers out into the world. It's what they gave the rest of their lives to living out, telling everyone, so that even you and I, all these centuries later, would come to know the power and the promise of such new life too. It seems to me that resurrection makes real the good news of forgiveness and love and grace and faith and trust and compassion and mercy, you get the idea. Resurrection stories are a promise of God meant for us to share. And as Jesus says, uh, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid to share them. That sharing them is now your mission too. And as you do, Jesus says, Jesus is there, Jesus is here, and he says, peace with you. Be not He said, I, the risen Jesus Christ, will be with you now, right now, always, to the end of the age, and forever, I promise. And we say, he is risen. <laughs> Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. That peace of God, which is meant to pass our understanding, but fill our hearts with hope. Keep your hearts and lives in Christ Jesus. Amen.